Thank you. Um, on the 13th of February 2014, Zengambola died at its home in Thameside. Following an investigation and inquest, the coroner's finding was that Zane's death was accidental finding. It is their conviction that Zane's death was caused by hydrogenite, hydrogen cyanide gas plume contained within the floodwaters. The committee meeting of the 14th of September last, the committee agreed that a report was to be, was to be prepared to consider how a full investigation and examination of the site could be conducted by the council as soon as possible. The committee required the report to be available for an extraordinary meeting of the Environment and Sustainability Committee to be held before the 9th of November 2021. The committee also resolved to note an item for a future meeting on the forward plan for a report proposing how the Council respond to new evidence relating to Zane's death. At the time of the inquest, the Council's then Principal Pollution Control Officer carried out a detailed desk study in accordance with the statutory guidance. This addressed the question of potential contamination of the site owned by Brett's Aggregate, which is to the rear of the Gambola family property. The study concluded that the risk profile of the site did not meet the criteria to allow continuation for further, even more detailed assessment. All for the site to be ca characterised as contaminated land under Part 2A of the Environmental Protection Act 1990. It is important to note that Section 3 of statutory guidance does not permit local authorities to continue on with an investigation unless there is evidence to support and demonstrate the need. I point this out because the Part 2A contaminated land regime is the Council's only legal tool that could be used to enable a site investigation, enable a site to be investigated as requested by the committee. Given what I have just said about the findings of the desk study, concluding that the risk profile at the site did not meet the criteria, to allow the continuation of further more detailed assessment, for the Council to be able to proceed to the next stage of a site investigation, it would need new evidence. To this end, our new Principal Pollution Control Officer has been reviewing existing files and researching around the information given to the BBC by an anonymous former MOD engineer who stated that he believes subcontractors working for a tank research facility dumped cyanide-containing waste into the gravel pits behind Thameside. This research is not yet concluded as the Principal Pollution Control Officer is looking to see if she can make an application to gain access to the MOD's archives. Another aspect which we are researching is whether Spellthorn Council would be able to carry out an intrusive site investigation of the site, as we do not know if it has the jurisdiction to do so. That is, does it have the legal powers? This is because the land behind Thameside, to the south of the M3, is subject to a waste management licence, which has not been surrendered and the land to the north of the M3 is subject to an environmental permit. Accordingly, the Environment Agency has regulatory authority <coughs> over the land covered by these waste management licences and permits. Section 1 of statutory guidance states that, as enforcing authorities, we should only seek to use Part 2A where there is no alternate appropriate solution existing elsewhere. In certain situations, 
the legal regimes for the control of water, waste and environmental permitting have legal precedence over Part 2A. As such, this way may well mean that Spelthorne Council has no legal powers in respect of the land behind Thameside. We have there sought legal expert advice regarding this. We received the documentation and the confirmation from the Environment Agency on the evening of Wednesday the 20th of November and this has been sent on to the Council's legal expert the next day. We are now waiting for their report. And that concludes my findings on this presentation for now. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. And this is quite a long um, agenda. It's um, somewhat longer than the agenda that Olivia and I saw at the members' briefing a um, uh, week or so back. Um, so... Before you board it, Chair, do you mind turning on your microphone? Oh, apologies, Tom, sorry. Um, yeah, as I said, this is a long and... and Report with a lot of information on it. Um, just for the record, it is very much longer than the draft that myself and Olivia saw at the um, planning committee briefing uh, a week or so ago. And I welcome this um, and all the extra details. Um, I think now I have to hand it over to you. It's fairly awkward to get a handle on, but who wants to kick off? Okay, Councillor Gething. Thank you, Chair. Um, so we've got a potential claim of cyanide having been dumped in the nearby lake by somebody who we don't know but claims to have information. Um, which I have to say is a fairly tenuous basis on which to make an application for to a court for permission to go in um, and excavate somebody else's land. Um, and I'm minded to um, remind all those councillors who may have received an email from an individual who apparently now lives in California, but is a previous Belton resident, and is a professional chemist, um, who fired off a fairly explosive missive at us, um, and reminded me of stuff that I'd learnt when I was doing my A-levels, and my original degree, which is a science degree, um, about the nature of cyanide. And quite frankly, if the levels of cyanide that had been recorded accidentally due to the nature of the test involved um, were genuine, there would have been mass, mass deaths around that area and not just St. Gambola. Both his parents would have been dead, the neighbours would have been dead, possibly people even across the river would have been dead. My view is that it's not only improbable that there was that level of cyanide or any level of cyanide present, but that it's, it is almost virtually impossible for there to have been that much cyanide. Um, I do not wish that's why I'm not, I'm not going to pass any comment on the Gambola family. They have suffered a terrible tragedy, and I, I can't. Nobody can accuse them of having done anything wrong. Um, but I think there are. There comes a point where our perfectly reasonable sympathy for the the tragic circumstances surrounding their son and their personal circumstances since needs to be tempered with realism and what we can actually achieve. And unfortunately, I don't think now there is anything that can be achieved. Um, and I don't actually think that the coroner can be criticised for his findings in the coroner's report, because having read that coroner's report, it's, uh, it strikes me as completely sound. Um, so I personally think that it is now time to draw a line under this. 
Karen? So, Councillor Gething, it would be really useful if you could forward that email on to officers because we haven't seen that. We would not Happy to do so. Thank you. Thank you. To, to Tracy. Yeah. Tracy, anything you want to add to that? No. Fine. Thank you. Who's next? Who's next? Well, Tom. Sorry, Tom. Thank you, um, and, and thank you, officers, as well. I recognise actually our timetables were very tight to give you a turnaround to produce stuff, and I am grateful uh, for the amount received here. But I'm also conscious that uh, almost in many ways for me to judge everything that I think based off of this one document probably doesn't give a fair representation of everything because I recognise there are just so many documents for us to talk through, and um, that's why I'm glad that it is a standing item that we will revisit because I feel whatever comes out of this discussion and whatever comes up in the meeting tonight we are not going to get, as, as this very rightly concludes, we're not going to have anything that we can do here and tonight, but certainly it gives us opportunities to explore how we have undertaken our statutory duties, but also as well we can feel confident in the processes that we've had in place and will have in place as well to ensure that we are um, doing our utmost really, I think here, not, not specifically to this case as well, but just to make sure that we can feel confident in ourselves that we are doing our absolute utmost as an authority, um, of which I have no doubt officers are. Um, the, in relation to this, I guess my, my, my first basis on which to start is, is obviously we've talked about a lot of the things that we can't do around the area. And I think one thing that was notably not very clear from the report that was given here, and particularly might be useful for any other people that were joining in from outside, is a discussion around what elements that we can control or what elements that we do monitor in the area, just so that we've got that as a benchmark to know what kind of work is undertaken on a semi-regular slash regular basis if such thing is done. Have we got any kind of top level idea of what work is done in and around this area, particularly in terms of monitoring in that regard at all? Yes, Karen, sorry. No, 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 no Tracy. I was, just, I was just about to ask for clarification on what you meant by what work is being done, but then you turned around and said monitoring. I take it you mean yeah. scientific uh, monitoring. Yeah. Um, in terms of um, gas monitoring, landfill leachate monitoring and um, to my knowledge we don't do any the agency does it for the site at the rear because they have regulatory power and is there anything in anywhere in the nearby vicinity at all that do we do any kind of level of that study and in terms of the access that's given by environmental the environment agency only because i think of other incidents and uh, i look towards leo neil on this because i know that this is something where we've, we've we've discussed before about our relationship and working and how we can understand information in partnership with environment agency on different matters uh, do we feel confident that there is a fairly open book in terms of that understanding and dialogue with the environment agency over over not specifically this site but particularly around any other site that, you know might come up on around an issue like this as well yeah. I'll let you answer that, Claire. Yes, so we work with the Environment Agency regularly. Um, mainly it's in response to incidents because um, there are areas where things are, that are reported to us are often their remit rather than ours, particularly regarding um, illegal waste activities. We work quite closely together and there's regular contact. I can say um, on occasions in the past I too have worked with the Environment Agency. Um, sometimes, even we get frustrated, sometimes people come to us and we are working on a case. And if there's a propensity for it to, or the possibility of it, that it might go legal, we will not give information because it could affect our case. Um, we have the same issue with the agency. If they are working on a case that might go legal, then they won't share information with us either. And it can be incredibly frustrating. I, I think that is, as, a, as a baseline is actually, and I will park that, I'm sure I'll have more to talk about, but I think that's quite an important baseline to work from as well, is that I completely appreciate and understand and, and I'm grateful for the work that the EA does. Um, but also our working relationship with them can be difficult at times. And so, you know, I, I do hope that we and, and I guess then in, in relation to this and from the work that you've been conducting thus far, 
the working relationship seems to be on a fairly open book and a happy basis on that, so there hasn't been any issues to that regard in that working relationship in relation to this at all. They were very forthcoming with information um, in preparation for this meeting. So, yeah, I, I can say everything's completely satisfactory there. Who's next? Tom? Olivia. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Olivia. <laughs> Olivia, sorry. Thank you, Ian. Um, thank you, Tracy, for um, the report. And um, I do know that it's a lot longer than um, when we first saw it. So thank you for the extra work that you've done on this. Join um, us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I notice, uh, I note that you um, have sent off some FOI requests. And I wondered um, whether if you've already done this in the past or whether this could be an action you could take as whether doing an FOI request on um, sort of people that have done all the research on the SO pipeline, because obviously the, um, <coughs> that would be very extensive um, over a, a long period um, and it would have possibly gone through that area and um, whether they avoided that area. I, I note that it's not going, it's sort of going stepped away, but whether there was reason to um, uh, change uh, direction at all, I think that'd be quite um, a good one to do. Okay. So, um, the SO pipeline is a DCO, so it's currently going through um, a stage where they have their own legislation that's granted that covers that DCO. So it's a little, little different to when something comes through um, our planning department because the, the control over the planning permission doesn't sit with Spellthorn. Um, however, we were a consultee um, and we have reviewed a lot of their documentation. They're now um, beyond the point where we're reviewing submissions at this current stage, but I think absolutely we can approach SO and ask them um, how they're progressing with their site investigations and whether there's anything that would aid um, our work regarding this site. It's a very sensible suggestion. Thank you. Who's next? Sorry, Tom? Yeah. Um... Then Joe, you know, I didn't really have anything um, after hearing what's just been said then to, to add the sort of and cover what I was going to say. But I think, um, yeah, we just we just really got to hope that this um, this you know we do we do get to to the root of this because having those good working relationships um, is important. But I mean, I remember when I was working alongside. Um, somebody in the Environment Agency here at Spellthorn who actually was involved in this case. This was over three years ago now. And um, they were saying to me um, that is the sustainability team where I resided and the Environment Agency colleagues I was working with, that um, to get involved with the Green Party, they said, would be madness in, in relation to this case. Um, they said the Green Party, uh, the, the local Green Party here in, in, in Spellthorn who were working on this way back then with the family were all crazy and that the family themselves were crazy as well. Um, obviously they were just trying to cover up the, you know, the fact that they'd killed inadvertently their own child. Um, and I think it speaks to how sort of potentially we all, we all you know, we all know, we can see how potentially deeply corrupt this, this is, and it's a sort of... Uh, Council Langdon, um, I said I will not take accusations. You might have doubts about the data, you are entitled to that, but I will not tolerate words like corruption, and please don't link it to any one particular party. Just to clarify, are we talking here about, there's not, it's just to note this report, isn't it? So it's basically, what I've understood is we're just sort of saying, we've got... Um, conversations that are ongoing with the Environment Agency and we're looking to potentially still do our own research into this, this site and do some tests to figure out whether or not there was hydrogen cyanide. Am I right in saying that? That's my understanding of this report at the moment and where we're at. Can Chairman Fisher assist? Yes. 
I think the, the, the essential message of the report is that we are fully complying with our duties under the legislation and statutory guidance and will continue to do so. Um, as far as all the other matters that have been set out in inquest findings, which, you know, I do apologise that you did get so much information, but we did think it was important that you all saw um, a detailed picture of, of this, that really that our only involvement as a council our only powers relate to contaminated land and the use of it. So there was no decision yet as to whether any intrusive investigations are necessary. That might come after further investigation if we find that. That's a matter, professional matter for the officers to undertake all the research and all the avenues that have been suggested tonight. And if indeed, if any members think of any others, please, please do let us know. We're more than happy to follow all of those up because we do want to be thorough. Yeah, in our really, investigation. I appreciate that, absolutely. Yeah, in terms of mentioning any individual party, it was just sort of to provide, to provide a bit of con contextual information there that I have from personal experience. But I think in terms of what Councillor Gething brought up around um, this email he's received talking about levels of hydrogen cyanide that, according to his scientific knowledge, doesn't really add up. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone of the, the other fact of the case that I was discussing with the family um, way back then um, when I was a recycling officer and um, considering getting involved in politics and in, in the local community. And they said that um, the fire brigade did actually record who attended that site several uh, readings of hydrogen cyanide and that those reports um, let the fire officers involved to actually leave the fire service because they were so outraged that they were told to just after the COBRA meeting at central government with with Boris, they were told to just drop it. You know, you 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 kept you you got kept those records of those cyanide readings. Just drop it. That's what they were told. So they actually quit the fire service, and the family back then was working with the fire brigade union. So when I'm using those kinds of words, chair. Um, it's because of that. So let's hope that we get to the root of this, is, is my point really. Um, um, Karen. Jim, sorry. Just to remind everybody, those may be political issues that you may have, or indeed community leadership role issues. As far as the council and this committee is concerned, we are only concerned with the issues of the potential contamination of land and the exercise of statutory of powers. The coroner's report does set out in quite some detail his findings as to the source of the cyanide. That was, there were a number of experts that were involved for a number of parties, including the family's own experts. And the coroner has made findings about that source of cyanide. And we mustn't forget that because that is a, this was a major inquest. It was a full inquest, counsel to the inquiry. Um, everybody was represented. So we mustn't underestimate how thorough that inquest was. Tracy? Tracy, do you want to say anything? No, I think Karen said it all. Yeah. Um, I, will, I will just thank that I was working with my Surrey Hotton quite closely with the fire service for quite a while and I saw the report that they filed on the day and the only guess on that record, report that they recorded was hydrogen cyanide. Um, now, as a layman, I would say, if carbon monoxide was the cause, why wasn't it recorded? Um, and I said, I actually physically saw the report. This was before the COBRA meeting. So I can understand some members of the FBU being upset quite reasonably because their professional judgment um, would apparently have been called into, a, you know, into, into question on this. Um, and having worked with these people quite closely for a while, I have a high regard for them, their training and their proficiency. Um, and as I said, I saw that report. It seems to have disappeared now, but I did see it. Who's next? Cathy. Um, apologies if I've missed something because my hearing's not great and I don't know if I couldn't quite, may have missed one or two things. But um, surely, if there's any shadow of a doubt, you know, the fire brigade's report differs from that of the commoners, for instance then there should be further investigation, either by the council or by the environment agency or by somebody professional who can do it, not just for the sake of the uh, of Zane's family, but 
for other people living nearby yeah. or now, now or in the future because you know if there's any doubt that this land is unsafe then people shouldn't be living there. Karen? Jim, thank you. Yes, our role is not in the reopening of any inquest. That clearly is not the council's role. Our role is only to exercise our statutory duties properly, and that's what we're going to do, of course. Um, if we do find something, then of course that's fine. That may be evidence in the future. But there is at the moment nothing that I can see. Um, and being a bit a lawyer like Nick, and I've read it all through in great detail that's new evidence, but that's not for our, our role to find new evidence. Our role is simply to exercise our statutory duties, and there is a world of difference in that. It is a matter for the family to instruct their own lawyers or any other experts that they wish, um, and I think it was their insurers that did that at the time of the um, inquest. That is a matter for them and not for us. And I really have to enforce that. It's a difficult message that we just really have to keep coming back to what our statutory role is. Although I'm fully conscious that you as a community leadership role, you do have that role you know, with the residents of the borough, and I, I do understand that. But I want to make sure that the messages are clear about what we can do as a council and what we can't do as a council. Tom? Thank you. Um, I think when I... I'll try and go down where we are and kind of where maybe where we're up to so that I understand it from my point of view as well. Um, in terms of the working with other the uh, with other departments within the council, because obviously I understand that as part of your assessment you'd be looking at those external. I was just wondering what kind of internal discussions you're having to see if anyone else has flagged anything in the area. And I draw a particular relevance only because this is where I started to do some of my research was under looking at planning applications and the planning team. And I don't know if that was any discussions that had emerged from any of those at all. So um, my team share a database with the planning team in uniform. Um, we work with them on a daily basis. Planning is actually the primary regime through which we tackle land contamination matters in the borough. 90% of sites will go through planning rather than part 2A. Um, and that is a smooth relationship. Um, we put conditions onto developments, you'll probably be familiar with those and informatives. Um, we, we use generally where there is suspected land contamination, a three-part condition which is staged. So um, it, it has layers in it whereby there's an initial desk study about a site, then there's a risk assessment, then there is an if, if necessary intrusive investigation at each stage that comes through my team. Um, my team are very experienced. I've got three officers who between them have got over 30 years land contamination experience. Um, and that all feeds back through planning. Thank you. I, and also, I just want to clarify, I have no doubt in your team at all, and I hope that it's not taken in any way like that. The only reason I mention it is... Oh, sorry. Tracy, excuse me, Tom. To add to that, um, the team also deal with uh, land contamination under building control. Um, so every time there is a planning, uh, planning and building control application, both, um, they will go through the schedules of both every single week. So every single planning application that comes through this council, every single building control, application that our guys deal with, um, the pollution control team actually look at, compare that against the historical land use database and that's where the information they have comes to the planning team and the building control team because they alert them to it and it isn't done just for um, land contamination, it's also done for air quality issues as well. So that's the proactive side to make sure that, you know, it all takes account of itself. They also have um, working relationships with the depot, planning enforcement, and um, anybody else who comes to environmental health and says, oh look, there's an issue here, we need you to consider it. Um, some of you might know about some of the land raising. Uh, we get involved in that. The team work with um, the planning enforcement team to tackle it. They work with, if it's significant, um, like some of the ones you've seen in Stanwell, 
they work with the Environment Agency. So whilst the, on those big ones, the Environment Agency are the lead authority, we will sit, assist with local information and local knowledge um, to try and resolve the whole thing. Thank you. Uh, the only reason I mention it is that when I was looking and comparing and contrasting messages from pre the incident that occurred, but also afterwards, the consistency still notes and still recommends, and so I'm drawing reference to an application in 2017 that still says that it's recommended that any planning permission granted has an informative on the proximity of a historic landfill outlining basic gas protection measures that should be installed on the site on a precautionary basis. So it suggests that it's still in there and there is still a level of concern. And I guess that's, you know, from my point of view, you can see where that creates that slight issue in my mind is that if the issue hasn't gone away, what can we then do? Because it feels that that's not in line with how we vision. And if we can't access that information, it almost feels like a redundant point to be made in there. Whilst I know it's not, it's a very important point. If we can't get any data back from it or we're not confident of that feedback, it just concerns me slightly. So um, there's a, a standard that is applied on a precautionary basis. If a property is within 250 metres of a landfill, we will provide an informative or a condition um, suggesting that a gas liner is, a, is a, um, a way to protect that property. And the applicants have a choice. in They can do a site investigation and do gas monitoring to demonstrate to us that they don't need it or they can just go ahead and install it. That's significantly cheaper just to go ahead and install it. So many applicants will do that. That's it. So that's Joe, Joe then Nick. Sorry. I just have one question. It may be, it might not be us, but do we have, bear in mind that hydrogen cyanide has been discussed today. Um, do we have any measuring equipment in place close proximity to indeed measure anything that may or may not be coming from that area. The Environment Agency receives data from the site to the north of the M3, which is covered by an environmental permit. Um, so historically, before the M3 was there, that was all one large site. Now we've got this situation where there's an unsurrendered licence on the south and then there's a, a live permit on the north to the north of the M3. So that area to the north of the M3, I think they receive monitoring data quarterly um, for quite a large suite of chemicals, um, which may include cyanide. They have provided the data to me, haven't had time to go through it yet. It came in shortly before the meeting. Um, we got a, bu a bundle last Wednesday night, which was very big, and I've been going through it, firstly pulling out what we needed for this report. So that's gone into our list of things to look through. There's some clarifications I need to make with them about that data because it's been sent to me in a fairly raw format, and I've got queries before I'm, I'm confident to speak about it. Um, in terms of other measurements for cyanide, we as a council, we don't do these kind of measurements. Um, if a property is coming through planning and they're doing a site investigation, they'll bring in a specialist who has that equipment. Um, but there has been previous testing on the land behind the home um, and also on the land on which the home sits. So within the inquest documentation, um, there was an, the, the insurance company who insured that property, brought in an expert who um, did some monitoring in 2014 around the property. Um, and then there was property, there was more monitoring done by the landowner on the land behind the home and also by the environment agency, um, none of which has conclusively evidenced hydrogen cyanide. Yeah, uh, thank you very much indeed. Obviously, you've got lots of information that you need to go through, and I appreciate that. It's just that if, in order for this to kind of be put to bed, so to speak, in the nicest possible way, we don't want to leave any stone unturned. We absolutely want to be in a position where we have exhausted every avenue within, obviously, the parameters that we can work in, which I absolutely respect and get. But I was wondering, obviously this was 
flood times. Um, we've had some significant rain this weekend, as I'm sure you all know. Um, I was wondering if it was at all possible to try and to eradicate it more than anything else. It may not be the way that we need to go forward, but I'm just thinking outside the box. If there were such equipment, which I'm sure there is, that could be put in situ in order to keep an eye on this area, just to be 100% sure. Now, I don't know whether it's in our remit in order to be able to do that, but I'm wondering if we could look outside the box and try and ascertain through various different agencies outside as to whether or not this is something that we should consider. Thank you. I can see Claire. I can see Claire's made a note of that. Thank you very much. Nick, and then Tom L. Um, I just wanted to um, point out because, um, in my experience, the issues of gas is coming from contaminated land. This is with my conveyancing hat on. Um, I relate more to methane than anything else, um, and. Um, and I know, having been on the M4 a number of times over the last few days, there's a large landfill site on the side of the M4 um, with a number of vents on it, and methane is, is the main purpose of those vents. So in terms of gas protection, it's generally the, the, the more significant issue. Tom L? Yeah, I just um, mm. want to mm. kind of think out loud here for a second, because it's sort of just seems crazy to me that we're um, not being a little bit more forceful here, both as like councillors and also I appreciate in terms of, as you say, what officers are sort of allowed to do within the, the law and jurisdiction and so on, but what we have jurisdiction to do as a council, but in terms of, as you say, quite rightly in our role as councillors, you know, what I've already said is, is, um, is that, but it, it's also, it's just, Everything's pointing towards this COBRA meeting that was held at the time that public health officials were advised not to mention hydrogen cyanide, which we know was recorded, was about trying to cover this up. Therefore, to say to our council officers, is there a chance that we could put this to bed? Whilst I appreciate what you're saying, Joe, which is what we all want to do, we all want, we, you know, that's what we all want to do. We want to just say, no horrific cover up has taken place. Corruption isn't there, and it's it's something that we can we can just say, you know, it's methane, and, and there's no risk of, of these substances that have been recorded uh, having caused this. But it's not just a gas, is it? It's the water running through that landfill site that has brought it into the house. It's not just about. Um, sort of venting off methane, um, to my mind. Um, this is about a nationwide crisis we're talking about here. Any property that's near a landfill site could potentially be deadly. It's in the government's best interest, if they're thinking financially, to cover this up. And that's what the signs seem to be indicating. That's what's written in the Daily Mail Okay, I'm looking at the article right now in terms of, you know, it, it's new documents have come to light showing that hydrogen cyanide, you know, was there and that public health officials were advised to say that it wasn't there. Why is that? I'm saying to you, the reason why I think that is, is because it would cost the government, not it would cost us as a council a lot of money, as is written in this report, it would cost the government a hell of a lot more money to investigate all of those sites nationwide that are close by to landfill sites. People with families, with kids, just like us, with relatives, all of our loved ones could potentially in future be near one of these sites and become disabled or deceased as a result of it. So that's why we need to not leave this stone unturned and we need to make sure that every stone is not left unturned nationwide. And that's the severity of what we're talking about here. That's why the government tried to cover it up. So, yeah, let's really hope this goes in the right direction. And this isn't directed at council officers, my anger, it's directed at the situation. And I'm sure you will feel the same way. Uh, I hope you will do. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to sort of just think out loud there and just sort of 
get this sort of trajectory back to where I think it needs to be, which is that's the severity of what we're talking about here. You know, it really is. Karen, so it's like that we can do that laugh all you want, but it's true. Do you know what I mean? But ultimately, that is what all the science seems to point towards. Two things, Chairman, if you don't mind me saying, yes. and please, if you think I'm going too far, please tell me to stop. The point of the whole statutory regime, there is a national system and process in place which places express duties on each and every council, and that's the statutory regime, the statutory guidance. It's a complex area, it's not a black and white area, and that is in place. The second point on the inquest is, and I don't know if you've read all the inquest findings, as far as I can see personally, you know, and I'm not advising family at all, and I have to make that perfectly clear, there were six or seven experts on this issue alone who gave evidence to the inquiry. The coroner was aided by counsel in his own right. There were numerous um, medical um, experts too, because the finding was that there was carbon monoxide poisoning, as, as Trace mentioned to begin with. There was a lot of medical evidence there too. So this, you know, it's not a cover-up. There has been a full, you know, compliance with the law. There has been a full and open inquest that lasted six weeks with all the parties represented, with a coroner um, hearing evidence from many, many people, including our own officers, on this issue. So, without stealing the chairman's thunder, I can't accept that. And also, just to clarify, I can't accept the fact that hydrogen cyanide um, was definitely ruled out as the, you know, the, the, as the cause of death because it's not actually possible to detect hydrogen cyanide. This is from the family's own words um, in a deceased body when a coroner is conducting that, that you know, um, cause of death research. Um, that's what the family have, have said to me. I'm not a, a, an expert in, 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 in this, but that, that's what they're saying to me. It's not actually possible to, to, to rule that out. Um, what the coroner has said is he believes it was carbon monoxide poisoning, but all of the evidence seems to suggest that it isn't. So whilst I appreciate what you're saying in that it is possible that, that, that the family we're in the wrong here. It's also possible that the government were in the wrong and that this is a cover-up, that is a possibility. And that's why it was in the local and national press not long ago, again. So I think it's very arrogant of us to laugh and look down upon that possibility, given that reality. I don't think I'll comment further, thank you, Jane. Um, I, I think, if I'm, I've got Vivian and Tom next, I, I, think, I think we just need to bring ourselves back and what we are seeking to do with this committee. And I think Cathy actually hit the nail on the head. What we are seeking is reassurance. We are actually not saying that this site is contaminated. What we are saying, we have serious doubts about whether it's contaminated or not and we want an investigation hopefully to put our minds at rest. Um, I know the report talks about remediation, we're not talking about that. Now I think to put our minds at rest and our residents' minds at rest, what we are seeking is to do an examination of that site, then look at the evidence that that throws up, then make a decision of what we can, can't, should, shouldn't do on the basis of that evidence. And I think this is about obtaining the evidence from which we can make um, a sensible opinion of where we go further. Um, and I still have a lot of concerns about what, you know, what is or isn't under that site. I can also recognise that there's an evidence base to say it's fine. I just don't know. And my worry is that is not good enough in terms of duty of care to our residents. And that's my view on this. And therefore, I would like to see an examination at site so we know where to go from here. 
And I think actually that's all we really want in this committee is to be able to put on the residents' minds at risk. And God forbid if there is something ghastly under, then we will have to act. But it is the lack of knowing, it's the uncertainty, it's the inherent duty of care that I think is the issue here. Um, but I think Vivian then Tom. Thank you, Chairman. Um, well, um, as we all agree, this is really, really just one of the most difficult things that you could face. Um, I was um, grateful to, um, that we've had like a positive suggestion about the SO pipeline, if there's any possibility there of help. Um, and we all want to be sure um, that, that, that what is, what was, whatever it is. But as we've known from other things, um, disbelief is the most difficult uh, thing to counter. And, you know, um, this is not meaning uh, any disrespect to the parents, etc. You would, you know, you have your position and your view, and you're in that dreadful, dreadful position yourself. So none of us have got that any thoughts there at all. And sometimes there is a flaw in the official data or the argument. But um, thinking what was said just now, I heard somewhere in here that the medical answer was that the body would have shown elevated hydrogen cyanide levels to, for that to have been the cause of death. Well, we have to believe, um, you know, we are we are just ordinary people, all of us, whatever roles we have here. Um, and we are presented with a lot of uh, scientific and professional, etc., evidence to, 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 get, to guide us away as to what the situation is. So if that was the answer done you know, 12 years ago, whatever it is, then um, surely that is the answer. I know it's, it's difficult. You don't know what to believe when there's disbelief. But, you know, there must be, the scientific community must be able to draw a conclusive um, result. Um, the fact um, that uh, certain um, officials, uh, fire brigade officials, or one or more, whatever, uh, said that they uh, had some readings that were suspect, uh, or, you know, it's, um, read that way, um, that would have been dealt with at the time. And I, I do agree that we want to be sure for our community and ourselves that no stone has been left unturned, absolutely. And issues do fall, as the saying goes, between two stools, you know, one person looks at this and one person looks at another. So I think, as you have just said, Chairman, that is really where we are. But we are just faced with all this expertise presented to us um, and we are constrained by our position and our, uh, what we're allowed to do and what our role is and, and that is what we have to respect and so we're not here to look at COVID or anything else we're here to look at our own um, our own position and authority and responsibility and that's what I'd like us to confine ourselves to I'm just leaving it there for a minute. One thing I, I know I was asked and I did check, um, the family weren't the only people to go to hospital on, on this night. Their next door neighbours also ended up in hospital. Um, I can't actually say anything about why, um, because their medical records are confidential and I do not know and I have not asked. But I am aware that several other families in the area, said, including the next door neighbours, ended up in hospital on this evening, in the early hours of the morning. Um, just to give a record, I said I can't reveal anything. I haven't asked. The medical records are obviously private, and I wouldn't ask. Um, just to do that. Can I just ask um, a sort of more general question? Um, if we were to discover a serious, I think the word is significant in the legislation, a significant. Um, risk or threat that, I'm trying to remember the words, uh, was a, affected a, re, a receptor, I'm trying to remember, is um, on the site or there was something that said that, 
Um, what would Spellthorn's obligation be in that case? How we normally do with these things is we would actually bring to the fore um, a site investigation. The, and there are phases of site investigation, as Claire has already alluded to. The first phase would be to look at what is the previous history, and we would scour records and all that sort of stuff to see if we can get a really good context um, on what the situation was. You then have to move on to a a risk assessment, for want of better words. So you take all the information you have and then you determine whether or not there is um, a reasonable possibility that the site might have substances in it that might be hazardous to human health, the environment or water. And from there, you then move on to your next phase, which would be site investigation. Each phase that you carry out informs the next. You cannot miss a phase because if you don't have the, previ the information from the previous phase, um, what is it you're going to be looking for? Where are you going to put your hole in the ground? What is it you're going to be monitoring? And all of this stuff. I have been in Spellthorn Council now since 2002. We have carried out a number of site investigations. And I can honestly turn around and say, never once when I go to the council on those occasions has the council said to me, I can't have the money. They are expensive. Remediation is expensive. There are no more government grants that we haven't always had the work covered by government grants. But never has this council said to us, no, we cannot. From a professional point of view, um, the officers, including myself, take it from an unbiased and unjudgment point of view. We are there to gather information, we are there to look at the information, and then we are there to look at from a scientific point of view, is there the potential of a risk that needs this to be looked at? From a legal point of view, if it turns around and says, no, I'm afraid not, then we are not permitted by the legal guidance to carry on. It tells us to stop. If it is saying yes, then we will move to the next phase. It's not a quick process. It takes a long time. And we would then put together a specification based upon the findings of the desk study to turn around and inform the next phase. So that's where we go from there. One of the things that we would also need to look at, and we haven't had it happen before, this is the first time for the council, whereby we've had something occur and we may not be in the position to actually go on with part 2A because of the position of the waste management licenses on the site. That being the case, the statutory guidance turns around and says that we may not take it under part 2A. It therefore has to be dealt with under the licensing regime of the waste management licenses, which is why we're taking on the legal guidance. Thank you. Thank you. Tom? Thank you, Anne. And, and, and that's very useful clarification. And, and I think I want to build on some of the other things that have come out from the discussion as well, because I think they raised the same points and, and it comes back to that actually that the element you were talking there about that layering and the stages in which we go through in terms of those assessments. On that basis and given that the same feedback is still being given to residents in a period over a prolonged period there, it suggests that we have built a profile of that area that suggests that we feel something about that area and we have that baseline. Is how do how would you feel is there a way in which that we could potentially, in, in future iterations when this comes around, that we could understand a little bit more about that profile, given that there was a level of concern that has been raised in the reports at that level to understand? And also, we were talking about the fact that obviously, independently, people go out and, and will agree to take in a uh, site. Do we, uh, is it ever possible at all to request anyone who might have had to install those in recent years, that if there was any assessment that was done, if they would be willing to share that information, given that I presume, as you say, it's not done by ourselves as the authority, but them as individuals. 
it, is that something that we may be able to access that may well also be useful to us in, as I say, just trying to build a picture around the area so that we can, again, I'm, I'm trying to find reassurance in something, you know. If there is some sort of baseline that we can work from and there is extra data out there that is not owned by us, not something that we can access through any of the working relationships we have, are those things that may well have something in there that can provide a level of reassurance to us as well, particularly about whether or not we would need to uh, reassess any elements uh, under either either, set, either statutory guidance. One of the things we could look at, if we haven't done it already, and it isn't already contained in the notes, is to look at um, when you have waste management um, sites and that sort of stuff, um, part of the conditions of that licence will be to require routine, regular monitoring. Um, and there are formats and methods and, you know, standards by which that has to be done. And the Environment Agency will oversee that in the same way that we do some other um, smaller uh, type of processes. We monitor those and um, ensure that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing and how they're supposed to be doing it. So we could look at those. And as I said, if we haven't already done it, I would imagine we have done it, but we could dig through the archives, we can look to see what we have in the area, and we can include that uh, within any next report, if it's available. Uh, absolutely, no, I appreciate that. I, 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 the reason that I mention this is, is looking specifically at application from 2010. Which, which, which I was looking at, which related to the to the relief lock keepers house, which is obviously mentioned in the inquiry, so I know that it is covered to an extent. But but the 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 journey on which the risk is assessed in it suggests there is changes in the way in which risk is either one assessed, which I don't think would be the case, or that something has been concluded from something that suggests that risk levels have changed, um, because the 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 PDA uh, the PBA report here from twenty ten describes that there would potentially be a potentially unacceptable risk, whereas by the time that we get to the point of the coroner's report, we've reached a point whereby we're saying, or that the coroner was able to conclude that there was not an unacceptable risk, on the basis that therefore no, no intrusive land assessment was required. It suggests that there has been a step that is missing, or that has happened or occurred in between, that may well be the reassurance that perhaps we were looking for, and I'm not saying this has been omitted at all, but I think certainly from our point of view, or from my point of view, that, that might be an area where reassurance could be sought in understanding some of those, uh, I, if I call it degradation, I don't know if it is, uh, certainly scaling down of, of the level of risk there. There must be something that must have been undertaken that it would be un good to understand the timeline of, perhaps, uh, to bring out more. And as I say, I, I have been through the coroner's report where, where possible, but I must admit there is only uh, there's only some access that you can get in terms of some of the stuff, so I imagine there's a hell of a lot more uh, the, 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 than I can I can possibly know. But certainly from the, from the bits of information that I've been able to gather, there's clearly lots and lots of elements that have been incorporated into it. So just understanding some more of that timeline to understand change might well be, be useful to us. Sure. So for the lock keepers cottage, um, there was a submission which maybe post what, you, what you've seen, um, which was a phase one ground condition report. I've got a small extract from it in front of me on risk estimation, which is um, what degree of harm might result and the probability of the consequence that will arise, which is how likely the outcome is. And for human health, it was moderate to low by that stage. So that's, they've, they've had a look at the site and, and it's been assessed as moderate to low. So they did some um, trial excavations to see if there was any um, made ground on the site, for example, trial holes um, and some preliminary work, and they will revise the risk assessment. So it's part of that phased approach that we were talking about earlier. Uh, and, and, and exactly, I think that's, that's, the, that's where I, you know, I, 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 I I'll be happy to admit where I my, my, my knowledge in this area is limited in terms of statutory routing and stuff like that. But I almost there is that entire community that resides there on Thames side that if they are still undergoing or exploring potentially expanding things like that, there are opportunities there where people will have done some work. It just seems odd that there might be a data set there that is uh, more recent that has something for us, or that if it is done and we have got it, that we are 
confident of and that might be something that might be worth just flagging or mentioning as well yeah it's a really good point we we do gather this data we archive it all um so you'll be aware that council departments have retention schedules and things where retention schedules don't apply is that if my team think information is useful in the future regarding land contamination we keep it um indefinitely and we can come back to it then which is the case with this it was from 2010 um and we do have um that uniform system that i mentioned so we cross-reference um, everything back to that when we're looking at a piece of land and that records incidents and planning matters. So we are doing that to some extent. We also use a GIS system and we have another database with Black and Geo and Byron, which is where we, we gather together um, risk around land that's got historic land use um, that that could give rise to contamination. It doesn't mean it's contaminated land if it's in that database. It just means that it's, it's got a history of land use where there could have been some contamination potentially. Um, and so we, we have those two tools at our disposal. Tracy? I think there's one other aspect um, within this is you're talking about two totally different regimes. You're talking about the planning regime and you're talking about the contaminated land regime. The test is so different. With the planning regime, you were talking about, um, you know, much lower levels where cleanup is required. So um, you can have, you know, the level of um, some, something that you might find on a site that's undergoing planning would be requiring to be cleaned up. And, um, you know, by comparison, if you were looking at it under a Part 2A situation, um, you wouldn't clean it up. Um, the government in the government policies turn around and they, they t say um, that the contaminated land part 2a regime under the environmental protection act is more or less the last resort and you should be using any other means you possibly can to resolve a problem and the difference between the tests um, for you to get to the point of dealing up dealing with a site under part 2a and this is what we look for we're not looking for the planning levels we look for um, something that might cause um, significant harm um, to human health. And there's a whole long sentence, and I won't bore you with that. Um, but that's what we look up at under Part 2A. And the government's policy turns around, and I will read it to you, and it's, it's within all the um, statutory guidance. And it's to ensure that the burdens faced by individuals companies and society as a whole are proportionate, manageable and compatible with the principles of sustainable development. Um, ultimately, whoever pays the price for remediation will either be the public, i.e. through the taxes, because the local authorities had to pay for it, including the site investigation. But before it gets to that point, and you have to go through various different source apportionment tests on, and liability tests and who's responsible for it. And it's the landowner um, who is in, first in the frame. And they call it that. Um, you're classified whether you're a category A or a category B. And if no one's in the frame, local government and i.e. the taxpayer pays for it. Um, but the levels that you're talking about, the test, is significantly different between the two. So basically you're talking about apples and pears. Sure. But the information that we gain from this type of thing is essential to the work of the team, as Claire has just explained. I'm going to come in here about this. Um, the report on the lot keepers cottage by PBA, um, it's, it's a sort of nested set of curveballs um, I got a copy of it about a couple of hours ago. I haven't read it. Um, but it also followed up with this email 
I should also add that this report is restricted to use by the owner of 241 Chertsey Road and cannot be used for any other purpose and should not be transmitted to any third party. Now we heard a little bit of it here, um, but I got put onto this report by a member of the public who sent me a page from it. So we are in a problem here. My understanding is I cannot reveal this report in public. I haven't read it yet. Um, but at least some of it is out in public domain. Um, and it is specifically, as I understand it, and said I haven't had it, only got it now to go. Um, it's not on the planning file, which implies that it's not a public document, although it relates to the planning application 10 36 full. Um, but there is some sort of report out there on this land. Karen. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, and you know, I put that email out because that's what I read at the back of the report. There were also all the various reports for the inquest. So one of the questions that we've asked council to advise us on is our ability to use all the data because there's lots of sources of data within those various experts reports as well. Um, I know that a lot of experts, when they make submissions to through the planning process, get very well, tetchy about the use of their reports by other people as they have copyright in it. And that's why we just wanted to be ultra careful to make sure that if we do have the right to use the copyright, then we will do. But if we don't, we're going to have to go back and, and look at sources of information and see how we can use it. Um, of course, a lot of this stuff was in the public domain at the time, but a standard clause is for, from all of these experts, architects, whoever, is to retain ownership of it. And we just want to make sure, because we don't want to fight like that on the side of the importance of actually getting on with the, um, the exercise and looking at the, the land with having loads of experts. So we just we, we are taking advice about that. We identified that a few weeks ago, that that was an issue that we were going to have to deal with in terms of the, the availability of expert evidence. But I think you can appreciate from members of the public, if there is a report yeah. out there, that said, I'm entitled to read it. Yeah. it. I would presume we could do it under a part two arrangement. Um, but I can't tell. It's the reuse of it. It's the reuse of the information that's the issue. It's their professional liability. Yeah. It's not covered by their insurance. Yeah. So if they've got anything wrong in that report, and they get sued for it, they're not covered by their insurance. So if that wrong is leads to a child's death? Well, if, if their report is wrong and it's making statements which are not true and that turns out that somebody acts in reliance on it and loses out as a result, then they can say, well, you've written this report. And he said, well, hang on a second. The report was for this individual. And on that, it's only on that basis that I produced it, and it's only on that basis it's insured. If you're going to sue me for saying something which I haven't said publicly, then I'm going to either have to deny the contents of the report, or I've got no insurance to protect me in the, in the event of me being sued. Uh, I can understand that, but you've got to look at the public perception. If the report is about a piece of land that is common to more than one property, which the, the site which we think might be contaminated is, then you know the public are going to have struggle, difficulty trying to accept that. And Chairman, as I said, we're, we're very conscious of this. That's why we've identified it as an issue that we're getting specific advice on about how far we can go with the reuse of the information in all the reports, because there's lots of reports and lots mm -hmm. of sources. Because um, if we can use it, super duper, that's great, we'll carry on. Yeah. Tom. Mine's probably a really boring question after everything else we've discussed <laughs> in this sense. It, to me, the question now, I guess, moves on to the timelines of which you expect certain information to be available, by which time we might be able to make some further judgments and by yourselves to give you time to properly analyse and assess as well. I think also understanding those would be useful as well as part of this. Uh, to just kind of frame where we got to in terms of discussion today as well, but just to know where we might be in terms of next steps and where we might next hear about it, because it might well be the fact that yeah. it, it, it's a lot longer than we think it is, but if there are potential updates that occur over a short spaces, 
that might well be the case, but I think that might be useful to just understand as well if possible, although I know it's probably a long piece of string. Tracy? Yeah, a bit like a long piece of string. One of the things that we've already mentioned, or two of the things that we've mentioned, is Claire's received rather a large bundle of technical information that now needs to be gone through and also compared with the information that we have. So that's one load of work. The other aspect, as she's also mentioned, is making an application to the MOD to enter into their archives and have a look with regard to this um, information provided by the BBC and their anonymous um, tip-off. So in the first instance, we've never had to do this before. Um, the fact that it's an application would suggest they can say no. The other thing is we don't know how long it's going to take for them to come back to us once we've made the application. But even prior to making the application, Claire and her team are going to have to have gone through the information and know what they're looking for. Um, you can't just go in needle and haystack and think, found it. It's a question of actually having an idea of what you're looking for as a starting point. So that's why they're going to need some careful you know, thoughts in dark corners to figure out what it is they're going to be looking for in terms of this and research around that to that information. That will take time. Um, Karen has also turned around and said that we are waiting for um, legal guidance from external um, expert legal counsel on this matter of who has jurisdiction. Um, it's not a straightforward one. Um, with all the goings on, and Claire has spoken to the EA, they have been very helpful, but they haven't turned around and said, yes, it's us. Um, so that hasn't proven to be very helpful. And the statutory guidance on the face of it is saying, it's not us. We don't, we can't turn, whilst we would, um, you know, stand next to the agency and turn around and say, we'll help wherever we can. And here have all the information that we can share, um, taking into account what Karen's just turned around and said about sharing information. Um, but we'll share whatever we can if it turns around to be the agency. Um, I have no dates for you for that. Shall we just know the next dates in yeah. the diary for um, the meetings of this committee? Oh, there's one on the 18th of January, one on the 8th of March. If we were trying to target the 18th of January, we'd have to write the report well before Christmas. And I have a feeling from what Tracy said that just is frankly too tight and that we could aim to put something on the forward plan for the 8th of March to update you more fully because there's no point coming back if we haven't got all the information. And, you know, there may be other questions that arise, of course, in the process, too. So if we could look to perhaps, Chairman... What I would like to do is put something on the um, 18th of January, even if it's only a verbal update of where we are. I think there are... The fact we now know there is at least one report on this land that we may or may not be able to access is going to make people... You know, it, it worries me. I'll be honest. I mean, ask me a question. Would I like to go and live along that piece of the river? The answer from me is no. That's simple. You can all make up your own minds. I would not want to go and live along there. It's a very nice piece of river. It's a very nice house. But no, I would not want, and particularly if I had a young family, I would be even more petrified. There are too many doubts about this site, I think, in most of our minds. We all accept there may be found ground risk. We've got to accept that. But there is, you know, there is a, 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 a duty of care and I think we are a long way from actually putting that to bed. So, uh, so Castle Langdon. This is just literally like one sentence. I just wanted to sort of like restore the purpose again for like what we're doing here in terms of another councillor had mentioned earlier about the um, coroner's report and this is the last thing I'm going to say, I promise, uh, about the hydrogen cyanide issue, but the report sentence I'm looking at here quite clearly states um, that in terms of Zane's cyanide reading, it must be noted that cyanide is metabolised by the body even after death, which is why 
the family were saying it's not actually you know necessarily possible to determine whether that was the cause of death from, from reading at a person's cyanide readings because it's metabolized by the body after their death just wanted to flag that council getting um okay a number of things first of all one of the issues we're, we're trying to prove is a negative which is inherently impossible um if we find nothing, people will still think there might be something there. Um, secondly, with regard to the cyanide readings that were obtained by uh, members of the fire brigade on the day, the only reading that was obtained was close to the road rather than close to the land behind. And the evidence that was given to the post-mortem uh, inquest indicated that actually that reading could be triggered by petrochemical emissions from vehicles passing on the road. And that the readings were so high that if there was genuinely that amount of cyanide around, from what, I've, uh, from what I understand, the, uh, the individual taking those readings probably wouldn't have survived. Um, so, whilst I accept that cyanide can be meta metabolised um, by the body even after death, um, although I'm not sure that's, I've, I've got no evidence one way or the other on that, but I'd simple Googling, can cyanide be detected in a post-mortem? The evidence is that yes, it can be detected. Um, and it even gives indications as to what would be mild toxicity and, and what would be likely to co cause coma, seizures or death. Um, and a simple Google search that I've made just now. Um, and finally, with regard to the COBRA meeting, um, I think it would have been perfectly sensible for somebody at COBRA to say, can we stop talking about cyanide because there's no definitive evidence that there is cyanide and that's just stirring up fear and, um, and panic um, and that would probably be my uh, reading of what was said at the COBRA meeting. Um, I'm sorry I don't accept Councillor Langdon's view that all landfill sites are about to uh, release volumes of cyanide and, and we're all going to die in our beds, um, which seems to be the thrust of his argument. Um, you know, there needs to be a balance struck here um, and on that basis I'm I am reasonably content and given that the nature of the post-mortem report uh, from the coroner um, I was actually I was actually reassured by that report I thought there was some sound sound assessment sound science and a sound finding um, and I understand that that's extremely upsetting to the family. Um, but I can't see anything to criticise in that. Tom? Um, I, I think... I, I think Councillor Gethin is completely entitled to hold his view. I think from my point of view, I look at us as an authority and us as a corporate body and what I would want from our council and our authority. Um, and that's not to say that Councillor Gethin is right or wrong in this regard, in regards to what we might or might not find. But I think certainly an expectation would be made of this council. Uh, and, and, as, and as Tracy has, has rightly pointed out, the council has never re re rejected any request for funds to be able to process any of these kind of inquiries and when things need to be followed up on. I think from my point of view, I think it's very, very important for us that we maintain that course of action, that we maintain that support in that regard to ensure that if there is resourcing that is required behind this, that we have facilitated that. And I think, so therefore, I don't want to say yes or no to either which way or either assessment, but I think certainly from my point of view, and I think if there is one thing that comes out of this meeting, if nothing else, is that we must ensure that we do have the resourcing available to officers to be able to make the assessments that they need to in order to provide the reassurance to us as a corporate body, but also to that wider public. So I think that's for me is something that 
I still think is very important and I just wanted to make sure that was noted as well from how I see is that you know we should continue to make sure that support is there and I hope that nothing that comes out from this to, to suggest otherwise. Nick? Nick, sorry. Thank you. Um, I, I don't have a problem with that either. Um, and I think the experience of all the work that this council has done in Denver Drive area of Ashford over a considerable period and at considerable expense, um, some 10 years or so ago now, um, demonstrates that this council has always taken that responsibility on board. Um, and um, and you know, there was never any question of us not dealing with the uh, remediation works um, on the basis that there was nobody else available to do it. Um, so, you know, I, I think this council's record on dealing with that sort of thing in the past um, has been found to be a good one. Yeah. Vivian? Yes. Um, I think from what we've discussed this evening, this evening and if there is um, additional material that needs to be gone through, etc., um, then that should happen. Um, and we should have as you suggested, just a quick verbal update at the next meeting. Um, I we don't think we could possibly ask officers to do a huge amount of work. It's just not time, the timing. It's already November. Mm -hmm. It just couldn't be there for, for anything to, just too quick. So I understand that absolutely. The problem we have is, as I said just now, that we are not specialists. And the page 45 of our report 35 of the, the inquest report is specific that uh, Specialist Centre of Cardiff Toxicology Laboratories heard from their consultant analytical toxicologist, uh, aligned with somebody else, that uh, uh, cyanide is stable in blood samples, never seen evidence of instability, and has had experience of measuring these things, and that if anything, the um, it has a tendency to increase rather than decrease. So and so that's all in the report. So we are just, we cannot know, that's my view. And I think we just make sure, we need to make sure that this council takes opportunity of reviewing anything that is uh, um, um, reasonable to, um, uh, to review further if it's brought to our attention. And I'm absolutely confident that our team uh, with their expertise will be able to do that for us and report back to us um, and as i said previously the problem is you get the zone you said as i said previously <laughs> sorry you know we, we we need to fulfill what we can fulfill within our ability absolutely and it's very very hard for everybody um, to just try and keep this within the, the realms of what we are allowed to do because this is a very emotive situation and all the laws that there are about who can do what, as was read out, have been made over overarchingly for balance. So we just need to make sure that in this case we have done what we can and should do and in that way to try and um, end up with the result that everybody is not satisfied, but um, I can't think of the word. Um, you know, that the, the results can be accepted, you know, and I'm sure there will always be some people who will disbelieve or want to make um, you know, a point out of something. That happens all the time. But we just need to be sure that we've done what we need to do and what we want to do, and which we would never, ever um, not want to do for our residents. And I think that needs to be written. I'm sure that is really clear to people, really, and we will do what we can. Yeah, I, um, just to, to pick up on a couple of things that Nick said um, about proving a negative. Well, I think if we were to do an investigation of this site, or someone was, and they were to prove that it was clear, um, it may not be good news for the family, but it would be closure, if you like, for us as a council, but it's clear. And I think the key element of that is the resident, the family's request that there is independent oversight of any investigation, because actually that's our protection as much as it is theirs. So if nothing was found, that's it. 
You know, we, we, we they, you know, they, they, they were, would like an independent overseer to any investigation were done. And that's as much protects us as it protects them. Um, and in terms of the, the readings and the hydrogen cyanide, well, if carbon monoxide was the killer, why wasn't that picked up? Because they tested for a range of gases. So it's not just that the um, hydrogen cyanide um, reading was allegedly, potentially, not absolutely, was possibly incorrect. It's the lack of carbon monoxide would also have been incorrect. So it's a double failure. Um, I'm not, I'm not an electrical chemical detection engineer, but you know there are two things that would have actually failed um, if that were the case. Mr. Castle Acton. You know, I, I got struck down. I'm just being honest here, and this is also, I suppose, beneficial in terms of me not seeming to be biased. But in fact, I haven't read this report, and I'm not talking about hydrogen cyanide theory, the sign of keeping my word to myself about earlier, and not mentioning that again. I think. What was concerning to me was that the family said to me three years ago, as well, I remember it clearly, that one of their main points was they were saying the petrol pump that they were using wasn't operational. And I mean, you've got same, like several people in that report who are saying that they said at various points in time that the pump was being used. Um, but yeah, they were like, they took it back to the company and the company even said like there was some sort of fault with the pump and it like was never used or something. So it, yeah, it's just, it is, there is a balance and it. There's a lot of conflicting evidence in there. There's a medical expert saying one thing, there's a medical expert saying another thing. There's different people involved, various reasons. And I think, yeah, we've just got to keep an open mind and see what happens with this. Um, so yeah. Anyone else? Okay. I'd just like to make the point regarding oversight that um, when the original phase one was done, it was reviewed externally. And we're going to have to make a decision about any updates as to whether we use um, an independent consultant to do the updating. And just to highlight, I hate to mention it in this context, but that there'll be budgetary constraints around that potentially, where it might need to roll over in March. And that's something we'll have to explore. It might affect time scales. Yeah, I, I mean, we've got to be mindful of the budgetary constraints, but my view on this, given the level of concern and potential risk, um, I hope the council would be very flexible and forthcoming in that respect. Um, it would have to go to uh, PCNR's a special allocation. Um, but from where I sit at the moment, I am, and I'm on that committee, I would certainly be more than willing to promote any extra expenditure in respect of this item. Um, that's as I sit and stand and see what I see at the moment. Tom? I, I was just going to say, I, I suppose if that is a concern that is something that is on potentially on, on officers' minds in that regard, I think if, if that can be flagged as part of that verbal update such that if a decision needs to be reached at corporate policy and resources, I, I think that would be useful to do so just because I think all of us agree that you know we would we, we we're keen to make sure this is supported and I know obviously we've got deputy leader and, and leader both in present here uh, as well as the chair who will represent the interests of this committee but certainly in terms of those budgetary requirements I think we all have to be pragmatic and make sure that we uh, we make sure that these are assessed properly but also that where we need to and I feel that's the will of this this committee certainly that that's taken forward and I'm no doubt the chair and vice chair will do so or not. Karen then Joe. Just to say really quickly, obviously we will have to follow the correct procedures as we support what we're concerned about and we fully understand your sentiments and that's, that's great um, in support if we, uh, request for cash does come forward because uh, it'll be quite a bit. Um, so we just want to follow those processes properly and obviously there'll be um, procurement issues as well but we'll, we'll sort all of that out. Jim, then Vivian. No, I'm just going to say something. Sorry, I was just going to say similar to what uh, Councillor. La um, sorry, Fiddler. <laughs> Tom, Ed, not Tom, Tom, Ed, Tom, Ed, Tom, Ed. Tom, exactly. Um, and absolutely, when we get updates, obviously in January, whether you know verbally and what have you, then I'm sure all those figures in accordance will come with that, and then we can obviously know where we're going with it. So if it could be updated, that'd be great. Thank you.
you. Okay, Vivian. Uh, thank you. Just to understand the process just slightly more. So it, um, I think you said there are sort of stages um, and you, you can't skip a stage and each stage informs whether it's sort of like, you know, like a flow chart. Does this happen? Yes, no. And then you, you carry on. So with the work that you would be doing, etc., um, presumably there is the potential that you might do stage this stage and then go then go to that stage and then it might be there's no, nothing there to pursue it further. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Um, just to point out, January will be a verbal update. Mm -hmm. The information that you're actually going to be requesting is going, I'm, I'm anticipating, I, I'm not prejudging, but I'm anticipating that it might require a, a fair body of information. And you think you had a big report this time, probably be bigger next time. So uh, make sure you give plenty of time to read it beforehand. There will be tests. Um, <laughs> so the team will need to, to prepare those reports. Um, as I've said, to go forward to the next stage of the investigation if that is found to be necessary and within our jurisdiction. Um, it has to be evidential. We can't just turn around and say, we're going to do this um, because we think it might be. We have to demonstrate that there is evidence to suggest that we need to. Um, and that will have to be presented in a, an appropriate manner and that manner is generally accompanying the report that you guys or whichever committee it goes to um, requesting money to go to the next stage and that stage will also include um, because you have to have the information what is it you're sampling for where is it you're likely to find it um, to because you could be digging in the wrong place so it has to be substantial um, and right so it will be done in the appropriate manner. Anyone else? Give you time. Okay, we'll wind the meeting up there. Um, I think this has been a very necessary meeting. Um, I think most of us are not desperately satisfied for a whole range of reasons, but I think we also understand why we're not. We just don't have all the information to make the decisions that we think we want to make. Um, I think there are clearly a lot of concerns about this site that we as councillors want to blame, um, and we want to pass that on um, as part of our duty of care to our residents. And I think the key thing is we are not going to simply walk away from this. We are going to keep at it until we get some sort of solution. Um, and I said we'll get a report at the start of January, maybe a full report and, and next actions in March, which may seem a long time. Um, but then if we get something better in between, we could always have another special meeting. No, you won't. <laughs> <laughs> We've had more special meetings of this committee than scheduled ones. Okay, thank you very much for your time, your consideration, um, and no doubt we'll be meeting again. Oh, Karen. Just to be clear, the committee is agreeing to neg the report. Yes, and yes sorry. And expect a verbal report back in January. Yeah. Just for noting purposes. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you.